Today's show financial editor Jean Chatsky joins us this week on Your Money, Your Wealth to talk about her money. No, not Jean's personal bank account. We're talking about hermoney.com, a new multimedia project giving women the confidence we need as we lead the charge into the financial future. Jean shares what women get wrong when it comes to money, how automation can help our wealth and our health, and why the gig economy isn't helping. Plus, Uber is going IPO, taking RMDs from your IRAs, the pros and cons of paying all cash for real estate investments, the pros and cons of 1099 versus W-2 employment, and why one woman's personal tax shelter was rejected in tax court. Now, here are Joe Anderson CFP, and sitting in for Big Al Clopine CPA for a few minutes, I'm Your Money, Your Wealth producer, Andy Last. Uh, Big Al has stepped out of the room, so Andy Last, can you believe that you are doing this? <laughs> I can. I'm, I'm actually, I'm really excited to be finally getting the chance to do this. Because we have probably the biggest guest we've ever had on this show. You got that right. And so why don't you introduce our guest? Miss Jean Chatsky. She is the financial editor of NBC's Today Show. She's AARP's personal finance ambassador. She's an award-winning personal finance journalist and the founder and CEO of Her Money, which is a multimedia company changing the relationships that we women have with money. And uh, that is inspired by her weekly podcast, which is Her Money with Jean Chatsky. Jean, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us today. Well, thank you for having me. I, I'm happy to be here. I saw you at FinCon, and it was great to meet you in person and to hear you speak. And one of the exciting things that you spoke about at FinCon was the rise of women. So let's talk about that a little bit. Tell us a little bit about how women are going to be rising in the next several years. So when you look at all or most of the demographic trends, women are leading the charge. It's true that we have not closed the salary gap yet. We are working on that. But for every 100 men who graduated from college last year, 132 women graduated. Already half of all millionaires are women, but more are coming. Women are going to inherit 70% of the $41 trillion that will transfer in intergenerational wealth over the next 40 years because we inherit both from our husbands and from our parents. And by 2028, women will control 75% of the discretionary spending around the world. So it is big. It is a big shift, and it's coming really quickly. Hey, so, Gene, the old-school broker mentality is probably not going to work very much longer. So I think what you're doing with your site is absolutely phenomenal. Tell us a little Thank bit about yeah, the, the differential of what you're trying to do versus kind of the old school, you know, staunchy 65-year-old white male trying to give someone advice. We want no offense to, to any 65-year-old white male. So just yeah, none at yeah. all. None at all. Look, we want to give women a comfortable place to learn this important life skill and to get comfortable with this important life skill. We did some research for the launch of Her Money. What we heard from women is that 80% of us say we are savvy and informed shoppers. 70% say we are savvy and informed voters and savvy and informed patients. We know what we're doing when we go to the doctor. We know how to ask our questions. Only 30% of us feel like we're savvy and informed investors. And that's just not okay because if you look at the other demographic statistics and facts around women, the fact that we continue to earn less than men do right now and as a result, amass less money in our retirement accounts. When we get to retirement, we live longer. And we have to make all of that money last a longer period of time. That requires us to be good investors and to be in the game. And right now, far too many women are sitting with big balances in our savings accounts, not confident enough to put that money to work. So what we're doing with her money is closing that confidence gap. You know, that's a really good point because with the whole behavioral finance statistics, that is coming more to the forefront. And one big bias is, is overconfidence. Do you believe that males have more overconfidence than females? Because we'll have female clients come in and they have millions and they're still really worried about being on the street. Versus yes. a, a male will come in with maybe a half a million dollars that's spending way too much money and has all the confidence in the world that things will work out. 
Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on it. We both correct a little bit too much in the wrong direction. So men may be a little too overconfident. Women are not confident enough. You know, there are many women who are fine investors, who are very good investors. We just haven't allowed ourselves to accept the fact that what we're doing by putting money into our retirement accounts every single time we get paid, investing that money in a diversified portfolio, not touching it when the markets get volatile, makes us a good investor. It does. We just don't quite grasp that. Now let's talk a little bit about the Her Money podcast, because that's also sure. available through hermoney.com. You're not just specifically focused on investing. You talk about We're all not. sorts of financial issues for women. Isn't that true? Yeah, because I grew up as a personal finance reporter. I've been in, in personal finance magazines more than half my life. And what I learned along the way is that money is not a financial skill. Money is a life skill. Money doesn't have to be my number one priority, but it is what makes all of my other priorities possible. And so I want to have enough to raise my family in the way that I want to raise them, to give back in the way I want to give back, to spend on things I want to spend money on because that is part of it and it can sometimes be a lot of fun, to save and invest in a way that makes sense for my age and my risk tolerance. And I want to know how to protect this financial world that I am working so hard to build. So the Her Money podcast, like the Her Money website, dips into all of those areas. And we've had conversations on everything from the economics of dating to why it's important to get enough sleep to the fact that there is a lot of shame and blame around the area of finance. And we've done it with fabulous guests like Gretchen Rubin and Arianna Huffington and Brene Brown and wonderful, wonderful women, Sharon Epperson. I'm, we've had, we've done almost, I think we're up to 150 podcasts now. And I would love it if your listeners, who I'm sure are, you know, we know because they're coming to you that they, <laughs> they value financial advice and money podcasts. I hope they'll give us a try as well. And we know we've got some men listening too, because they write us letters and yeah. they apologize. <laughs> they say, Hey, you know, I'm a guy. I'm really sorry. I'm a guy, but I listen and I get a lot out of it. So Jean, let me ask you, what are a couple of things that you would say are main issues, money issues that women get wrong? I think the biggest is and this is just true for women. It's certainly true for me in many aspects of life. I like to know the answer to every question before I take action. And where money is concerned, sometimes there is a correct answer. What's the best credit card available right now if you want to collect frequent flyer miles? I can answer that, mm -hmm. right? And I can answer it correctly. What's the best stock? I, I can't answer that question, you know, because what what's the market going to do next month, next year? I, I can't answer that question. I can't answer it perfectly. And when we require ourselves to give perfect answers to these questions for which no perfect answer exists, sometimes we get stuck and getting stuck is the mistake. You got to figure out a way to get yourself to take action anyway and get comfortable along the way with the imperfection of the process. So what do you see happening with hermoney.com? What's the future of this wonderful website for women? Thank you. We are publishing new content every day. We've got a great newsletter, goes out twice a week, that helps you keep up with what is happening in the world with your money. We've got Her Money Happy Hours where, that we are doing live across the country, meeting our viewers and our readers so that we can hear firsthand what's on their minds and more more podcasts more just more 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 so we hope that um, we hope that your your listeners will subscribe and um, will subscribe to the newsletters maybe join us on our private Facebook page where we've got thousands of women talking about money every day. We're talking to HerMoney.com founder and CEO, Gene Chatsky. If you're enjoying the show, do us a favor and share it with friends. Visit the podcast show notes at YourMoneyYourWealth.com for a full transcript 
and links so you can share the episode via email or on your favorite social media platform. Check it out at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Gene, I want to ask you a question on your latest book, Age Proof. Uh, living sure. longer without running out of money or breaking a hip. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I, was, I cannot take credit for the breaking a hip part, but I did write this book with a doctor. I wrote it with a doctor named Michael Roizen, who is the chief of wellness at the Cleveland Clinic. He is a genius. But what we determined along the way was that you don't need a totally different toolkit to get strong in your health and your finances. Many of the same strategies work for both. Yeah, and I think it's equally important, if not more. I mean, if you, I think if you have all the money in the world and, and you're miserable and, and you're not healthy, you know, either mentally or physically, what's it all for? So those two go such hand in hand, and I thought it was an awesome idea to put those two together. Losing weight and getting in shape is a billion, trillion dollar industry. Right. But it, I mean, it's fairly simple. You just got to get a little sleep, maybe work out a little bit and, you know, eat healthy. Um, I think yep. we all know that. But the execution is almost impossible. And I think well, it's, it's the same with money. Right. Right. It is the same with money because we're human. And when you think about this task of eating less and exercising more, it requires you to give something up, right? It requires you to give up the chocolate cake that you want right now. Oh, it come on. It requires you to, <laughs> yeah, I know. It requires you to delay gratification. And the same is true when we're asking people to consistently spend a little less and save a little more. What do you think people can do? Because I know there's been studies, I think Merrill Lynch did this a while ago. You know, if they saw a picture of themselves 20 years in the future, that they were a little bit older, a little bit grayer, a little bit wrinklier, then all of a sudden they would save a little bit more money because they were taking care of that future self. Uh, yeah. What are some tricks and tips that potentially you can give us to think about our future self and not be so concentrated on our today self? So the visualization really does help. I don't know if you ever did that Merrill Lynch exercise where you age yourself. I think the app was called Photo Booth or something like that, but I did it and it was really, really scary. <laughs> so um, yeah, you should everybody, I, cause I, I called the researchers and I asked them if I could just look at a picture of my mother. Cause I love my mother, my mother, you know, I kind of look like my mother and they were like, no, you have to look at yourself. So I did it, I'll never do it again. Um, <laughs> But you can use techniques like visualization in other ways. You can visualize your goals. I mean, it does help to make your goals tactical, to be able to see them, name them, know when you want them. That said, nothing works like automation. And automation is the best tool that we have for financial success. It works better in money than it works in health. I mean, Dr. Roizen, has me convinced that you actually can automate some of your eating. If you can figure out a couple of breakfasts and a couple of lunches that you like well enough to have on a regular basis and just keep them around. I mean, this is why you will always find Siggy's yogurt in my fridge because <laughs> I can eat it for pretty much any meal of the day. I can like it pretty much any time I eat it and it's grab and go. If you automate your financial decisions, automate your savings for each and every goal, and put that at the top of your priorities list, as long as you're satisfying your savings goals, it almost doesn't matter what you do with the rest. Yeah, that's so well said, because I think people get it the opposite. You gotta pay yourself first and spend everything, right? You don't need to just hover and stress over a budget. If you figure out what that savings goal is, do that, spend everything else, and I think more people would be financially secure. But we end up you know, saving last. It's like, well, everything else has to be paid first, and then we put ourselves last. So if we can just flip the switch there a little bit, you're right. I think more and more people would find um, that it's not as difficult it, it, it is to save um, once they just get in that habit. Well, and, and the nice thing about um, getting in the habit is that getting in the habit is in and of itself a confidence booster. So one of the things that I do that I find I take a lot of joy in is visiting my savings. I, I go on a grand tour. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in mental accounting and, and what that means in my life is that I save separately for a lot of different goals. 
Um, I just have, you know, your bank will allow you to open as many savings accounts as you want. Once you've got your minimum balance, they don't charge you extra. So I just open them for my various goals and, and then I visit them. And it's, it's nice to go on a tour and see, ooh, my 529 is here and my, um, my 401k is here and my rollover IRA is here. And just to um, take part in the fact that you're making progress toward whatever your goals are. I, I did a big survey of money and happiness a while ago for a book that I wrote. And what um, we learned in the research is that getting to the goal is in some cases even a little bit of a letdown. It's the process of going that makes people really happy and really satisfied. Jean, I would like to ask you a little bit more about your um, presentation at FinCon, where you talked about the big money ideas for the next five to 10 years. Specifically, I want to talk to you about work that really works. Can you tell us a little more about that? Sure. So um, I was focusing on um, the fact that 90% of the increase in jobs um, over the, the, the last decade has been in alternative forms of employment. We're talking about gig work and freelance work and temporary work. The, the problem with that is our whole social safety net um, grew up around the idea of full-time work. Mm -hmm. You know, jobs came with health insurance and retirement and training and retraining. And maybe if you were lucky, you even got stock in the company. And today we've got all these gigs that don't provide those things. Um, and when we read stories in the paper about income inequality, I think what we have to step back and remember is that the gig economy isn't helping. Um, that income inequality is a year to year symptom, but wealth inequality, because you don't have an employer who's nudging you to put money in a 401k and matching your contributions, um, is, is a longer lasting and growing problem. Mm -hmm. um, and what it means is that you're not, unless you're doing these things for yourself, you're not building this foundation that's going to allow you to jump from one job to another. And so what I, um, what I think we will see, and, and it's funny, right before FinCon, there was a story in the paper about Airbnb and mm -hmm. how they are considering giving shares of stock to the people who run Airbnbs. And, and that's, that's what I'm talking about, that we're going to have to start to see a transfer not just of income but of ownership um, if the gig economy is going to be sufficient to actually uh, support people long term. You know, um, just piggybacking off that, you know, you got the gig economy where, all right, well, maybe I'm very successful within my gig and I make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but then I have to put together my own 401k plan or if I have to put together my own benefits plan, which is just another layer of sophistication because maybe I'm really good at a certain activity, but not necessarily the finance aspect of it. And I think you're absolutely right because we see um, individuals, you know, you, you, you got Tom and Harry or Julie and Jane, they work for, you know, very similar industries. They make the same amount of money. They're, they have the same sophistication level. But if one person has a 401k plan at their employer and the other one does not, in the next 20 years, if they stayed with that employer, who's going to have more money saved? In most cases, the person with the 401k plan, because it's so easy. It's just out of sight, out of mind. I just check a box and the money goes in. For the other individual, they have to do a lot more legwork and work or some work that might be uncomfortable or maybe intimidating for them because they're not very comfortable with money. So you're absolutely right. I mean, I love the gig economy. And I'm not saying, hey, if you're an Uber driver, you can't make hundreds of thousands. Well, that would be pretty hard. You would have to drive all the time. <laughs> But um, but you're right that they you, you they need to get a little bit more ownership and some equity in in, in build that wealth. Yeah, I, I think that's that's very very well said. And and there are service companies that are stepping up to sort of fill that gap. That that are I, I see them advertised when I take the subway. We can be your back end benefits provider, right? Um, but it's just a matter of the entrepreneurs understanding that. 
um, you can't just take all this money that you're making and use it to pay yourself and enjoy yourself. You have to build yourself a foundation for your future if nobody else is doing it for you. Gene Chatsky, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. That is Jean Chatsky. She is the financial editor of NBC's Today Show. She's AARP's personal finance ambassador. She's an award-winning personal finance journalist and founder and CEO of HerMoney.com. Check out the Her Money with Jean Chatsky podcast and sign up for the newsletter at HerMoney.com. Jean, thank you again. Thank you. Now, Your Money, Your Wealth isn't exactly the Today Show, but it is also a TV show. You can check out the latest episode, which happens to be on retiring in a gig economy, at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And just like the podcast, the TV show features the unique and entertaining personalities of Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. What the heck is a gig? You ever hear like a band say, hey, we got a gig? Now this whole thing is getting crazy. It's a part-time job. So everyone needs a part-time job, so the whole economy is going gig. Al, can you believe it? What the hell is going on? It's almost a new word. It is a new word. And we're explaining it today on Your Money, Your Wealth. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. New episodes of the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show are available every Sunday. Andy Last was filling in for you, big guy. Yeah, the last interview. I missed the interview. You did? Yeah, it was great. I heard Gene Gene Chatsky. Yeah. She's very famous. Yeah. <laughs> you you never heard of her, have you? No. That's why you were not involved in the interview. Have you ever watched the Today Show? Uh, yes. She's the financial editor for the Today Show. Oh, okay. In, in between Jeopardy and... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a morning show, oh, right? Yes. So I'm working. <laughs> Got right it. That time. You know, we were talking a little bit about gig economies, and uh, when I was walking in, you guys were chatting, what, who was well, making $20 an hour? Well, we are talking about Uber drivers. Yeah. Did you know Uber is um, going to do an IPO next year. I did not know that. And you know what the valuation is of what they're thinking? So I guess, um, I think it's Goldman and Morgan um, are trying to get the sweetheart deal to to bring Uber yeah, to, uh, the, to public the public market. Yeah. Yes, to the public market. Any guesses what <laughs> that valuation would be? Uber. <laughs> Uber. Well, let's see. Um, well, because of the way you asked it, I'll, I'll say it's probably high. So it's over a billion. Hundred and twenty billion, sir. Holy cow! <laughs> oh my goodness! One hundred and twenty billion. One hundred twenty well, billion dollars. Because they're going to have Uber Air. They've got Uber Eats. Uh, Uber's going to try and take over the world. Uber Eats. They said twenty billion dollars just for Uber Eats. Really? <laughs> and I use Uber Eats. I can see why that's twenty billion dollars. So, so that's worth it. One hundred twenty billion. Think about this. All right. I was listening to a podcast, and they were talking about uh, the big three in Detroit. So that would be Ford. Chevy and um, Chrysler, or yeah. Chevy under Chrysler. Uh, yeah, no, it's Chrysler. I think. We're, okay. we're anyway, Dodge Chrysler. I don't know. The big three. Yeah, the big three. It's, it's auto, Chrysler. Auto manufacturers. Chevy and Ford. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're worth 120 billion. The, the three, three biggest, of them largest. Together. Right, They've been together. around for how long now? And, and Uber. And you got Uber as an app. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's how times are times changing. Times they are changing. Yeah. Times wow. Are okay. Changing. Well, that so. seems a little overpriced to me. I mean, so I, yeah, your I twenty dollar made... Uber driver, if he would have put twenty dollars into Uber, he would have made five thousand. You know, ten years ago. <laughs> right. I was telling Al that in in riding Uber all this week, I got a, a driver who was a former mortgage broker, and he told me that he's got a spreadsheet and he figures out all the wear and tear on his car, and he's still, if he make, works a forty hour week driving Uber, he's making nine hundred to a thousand dollars a week. He's driving a lot. I know. <laughs> so, what mortgage brokers probably make more than that? Well, he—that was what he retired from. He's uh, so, and he's, he's, he's a retired. He said he couldn't handle See, the the moral side of of the mortgage. What helping people get industry. into homes? This is, I'm telling you what the man said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, so. you, you know how that works, though. You retire, and then, you're, then you realize, oh, whoops, I don't really have enough uh, income for retirement. So then you go back to the gig the economy. Gig, the gig economy. Mm-hmm. And in yes. between, he actually owned Salon Day Spas in the Carolinas. So that's what he actually retired from. The man was a bit of an entrepreneur. He's pretty yeah. cool. He's driving Uber. So yeah. he's pretty yeah. successful. Yeah, yeah he's, uh, <laughs> you can make 20 bucks an hour, I'm telling you. So, if yeah. He, if he makes 1000 bucks, 400 40 hours a week. That's, so that's about 25 bucks an hour. That's yep. not too bad. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's so, and it gives him a chance to meet people and right. tell and a he's story. He's social, right? right? So, yeah. Okay. But Good. I thought you guys were talking Uber. I thought that was some, some interesting news that, that yeah. our listeners would yeah. enjoy. Yeah, of course. This is from Tax Advisor Magazine. It's a riveting <laughs> magazine. <laughs> I can't wait to read this article for you. <laughs> but um, anyway, this, this, uh, <laughs> I just saw this. It was a, it was a page turner. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't put it down. 
<laughs> but anyway, I thought you might like it, Joe. And, and if you if you like it, our listeners may or may not. I don't know. <laughs> but so I thought this strategy that this lady came up with. First of all, it was denied. Okay. But I liked her thinking. Got it. So, so don't so, try this at home. So, yes. Yeah, don't yes. don't do this because it didn't work in tax court. So here's a lady that was fond of shopping, okay, but not paying income tax. Okay, Fair. so uh, seeking to combine her love for shopping with a desire for an income tax cut, she developed in 2010 a charitable deduction scheme that she described at her tax court as her personal tax shelter. Hmm. Yeah. So here's, here's. She actually went to court and, and call, this, said, this was her. Yeah, that case. was her defense. Oh my God. Didn't work. Anyway, here's here's what she did. She learned at some point that a taxpayer generally may claim a charitable contribution deduction for an amount equal to the fair market value of the donated property, which is true. Whatever the property is worth when you donate it, that's 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 the that's the contribution amount. Typically, you buy. Um, so sh- she's buying clothes and she's donating them back. Yeah, so here's what she did. So the charitable contribution, um, she went to a discount store. Uh, she used uh, Talbot's, I guess, which I guess is a woman's yeah. clothing store. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I guess they have really, in many cases, discounted prices. So, okay. she, so she bought at the discounted prices and then claimed the charitable deduction for the full for market the full value amount. had wow. she gone to another store because that's the fair market value, right? So, right. so let's just say she spent... 25 bucks on an item that you would normally buy for 50 bucks. Uh, sure. Yeah. So she paid 25 bucks and deducted 50 bucks. So I, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> but tax court said, no way. You can't do it. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Good, it, it, interesting strategy. I guess if you think about it, I mean, that is true when you give away an item uh, that uh, is, uh, is for charity, it's the fair market value. You, and you could literally, in some cases, you buy an item like an old car and you fix it up and now it's worth more and you give that away to charity. Yeah, it could be, it could be a higher deduction. So what was the tax courts, does it say what their rationale was for denying it? Because uh, it's fraud? <laughs> yeah, I didn't read that far. I was lying when I said it was a page turner. Yeah. <laughs> that's Did you fall far, asleep that's after far, like that's as far as I got in the article. <laughs> that's a good question there, but I thought uh, anyway. I it, it's a, it's an interesting idea. I, I'm sure the rationale. I'm going to guess now since I didn't read the rest of the article was the fact that if you pay 25 bucks, then that's the fair market value. Yeah. For some legitimate charitable strategies and tax deductions as we approach the end of the year and you prepare to file your 2018 taxes, download our free 2018 tax planning checklist. You'll find the link in the show notes for today's episode at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. It does not list all the crazy things that people have tried and failed to write off, but it does reflect the changes from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and it lists all the documents you need and items to review before you file your taxes for 2018. Find a link to the two 2018 tax planning checklist in the show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now it's time to open up the email bag. If you've got money questions or comments or suggestions for the show, call 888-994-6257 or email info at purefinancial.com. we got Bonnie. She's a blogger at 40throughbluedoors.com. 43. What did I say? 43. 40 through? I don't know what you're trying to say. I don't know either. <laughs> okay, 43bluedoors.com. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, I love your podcast and just finished listening to episode 188 with uh, we, Cupert on real estate. We investing. have that many, huh? I think we got a lot more now. All right. Well, thank you for listening, Bonnie. Uh, she listened to the episode with uh, your boy Cupert on yeah. real estate investing. Yeah, that was kind of fun. And um, then you mentioned, I'm not sure who uh, she's referring to here, that everyone who makes money in real estate leverages loans. That sounds like a big owl statement. <laughs> Is that what I said? I don't know. There are a uh, few of us. Who did not do it that way? Personally, I don't have that much risk tolerance, so I paid cash for all my rental properties and now fire on income from them. Like it. I view them as diversified investment. Thankfully, I have them, so I don't stress out as the market falls. Again, love the show. Thanks for all the great information. Well, let me comment. Bonnie, I agree with your comment. If you can, I love putting all cash down. That what happens, a couple things, is your rate of return is less generally in an appreciating market because you're using all of your own money instead of borrowing other people's money. But your risk goes way down, too. And so if you can buy properties with all cash, I'm, I'm all for it. I think that's a great way to go. Most of us cannot. 
but uh, well, they cannot in San Diego. Yeah, because average property price here is probably six hundred thousand dollars, right? And a lot of the homes you, that you're looking at would be a million dollars or more. Sure, you, that would be a probably not a really great investment for a rental standpoint. Probably not. And right. the reason for that is that let's say you get rents at what? Let's say a million dollar home. Right. Three thousand rents? Yeah, yeah, maybe something like that. So that's thirty six thousand for the year. What you really want to do to make this work out is one percent of the value per month. So one percent of a million dollars is ten thousand dollars per month. That's a hundred twenty thousand. That's where the math really works well on these. And so there Isn't are twelve thousand? One percent of one million. Oh, one percent. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's ten thousand times twelve months. Is one. Got it. Got it. Got, got it. Got you it, with got me? It. Yeah. Yes, I'm with you. Yeah. That. Okay. So, at any rate, if you live in a part of the country where you can, your rents are one percent of the value, then to the extent you're able, keep buying up property. Sure. Yeah. And, and there's a ton of areas there in, are. in the country where you can where you can do that. Yeah. Uh, Texas is kind of known to be an area, not so much around Austin, but but uh, maybe some uh, Dallas. Dallas, maybe Texarkana, Houston. Yeah. <laughs> Amarillo. <laughs> Let's see what else do we know in Texas? Yeah. <laughs> that's, Houston. That's it. I said H Town. Um, yeah. So yeah, if if you have multiple properties that you paid cash for, and then you got a cap rate of three or four or five percent. Yeah. I mean, then those yeah. are really good cash on in, cash properties. In Texas, it can be ten percent. Nevada. That, that, yeah. Some places. Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. Some places. Florida. Yeah. Probably Minnesota. Ten- Tennessee. Iowa. Minnesota for sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Alabama. Uh, but anyway, you just got to do your homework and yeah, research. That's right. And so I, I think we hear with um, real estate investors is that, okay, well, I'm going to buy you know, in my area. Well, okay, that's great because you can go look at your property. But yes. w- when you live in some areas, I mean, you, you know, New York, for instance. Yeah, what if you you're live not in New York buying, City? Yeah, you're not going to be buying a bunch of- Let's see, I'll buy a condo all cash for $3 million. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so I think, Bonnie, we're on the same page as you. And I think our comment was, with leverage, you're using the bank's money, and if you have time and you have cash flow, it works. But I remember this very well. Okay. What? Is that I thought Cupert was going to blow himself up. Well, yeah. Because he was all levered up. I do. And we asked him that. Yes. And he's like, I'm fire. (laughs) <laughs> because I got all these properties and I'm leveraged up, and I was like, "This guy's gonna blow up. He's gonna be just like the video game." And I think I mentioned on on the air that the problem with that is every guru that I've read their books on has gone bankrupt at least once. Right, and, and it's because they bought this property A, they levered up to buy property B, levered up to buy property C. The next thing you know, they had twenty properties, and the market turned, and they couldn't afford any of them. Right. So um, Bonnie, so, yeah. uh, she's a blogger at Forty Three Blue Doors. So, yeah, I think we're on the same page there. We got Bob uh, Bob from uh, San Diego. Um, I do have a question. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. On your program last Sunday, uh, you made, um, what is that word? Empathetic. 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 I mean, that means aggressive. That, that means strong. <laughs> that means a very strong point. Yeah, well, that, when an <laughs> RMD is exercised... The percent of withdrawal must come from each separate IRA account. My RMD starts next year, and I have two accounts. I am being told that I can take the combination of two accounts from one account. Is this a new rule? Is there an IRS documentation that you can prove your nonsense from? <laughs> I added that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. good ad. So, Bob, um, so maybe you maybe misunderstood what we said because uh, if you have IRAs, you can aggregate all the IRAs as if they had one account. You can take one RMD. However, when you have 401ks, 403bs, 457s, you have to take a required minimum distribution from each account separately. And you may have several if you worked at several employers and right. never rolled to an IRA. Yeah, so he's right. But I think sometimes when we say 401k or 403b or something like that, people think people IRA. IRA right, right, exactly. You know, it's a retirement account, IRA, or whatever. But no, it's very specific yeah. when it comes to arms. And that's the maddening part is it seems it like it, sh- it shouldn't be this complicated. It's so maddening. And I'll say it at <laughs> empathetic point. <laughs> it's maddening. <laughs> uh, I like the verbiage, oh. Bob. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that cleared that up. And we got Mac, um, our good buddy Mac from Brookfield, Connecticut. Wow. He goes, Hey, Joe, love your show. He said Joe and Al. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just Joe. It was. 
Hey, Joe. Yeah. Comma. Al. <laughs> no. Well, I didn't well. It just kind of <laughs> blended. I love your show. Thanks for all the valuable advice and guidance. And so here's this question. Uh, Mac, I think I'm going to send you a bill for this one. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a long one. My wife is a dentist on W-2 working for a private clinic, and she does not get any benefits. Only this year, after three years of service, she got a $10,000 in a SEP IRA from her employer. She won't be able to contribute to this uh, like she can with the 401k. Also, this does cause some hindrance on doing backdoor Roth conversions. Good for you, Mac. Yeah, you, that is a correct statement. So far, so good. So um, I was looking for more retirement options for her and stumbled upon some videos on Mark Kohler's YouTube channel. First of all, Mac, you can find all your retirement needs in videos right here at Your Money, Your Wealth. You don't have to go to Mark Kohler. You don't got to go to Mark Kohler. I never heard of Mark Kohler. I'm going to have to look him up. <laughs> I'm fact, sure. Fact check. Fact check. He's probably better than us. Pro- way better. Maybe you don't. Well, he turned our channel up. off and went to Mark Kohler. <laughs> right. Um, all right. And it sparked his interest, thought of my wife su- switching to 1099. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so her work is not supervised. She gets a percentage of her production, not hourly, um, and also no typical employer benefits, so no vacations, medical, dental insurance, et cetera. So we could argue she is more like a 1099 employee than a W-2. However, I do realize it's up to her employer to agree with this or not. The reason for switching to 1099 is that she might be able to reduce overall taxes and fund her solo 401k by having the LLC S Corp. She um, see attached. Rough calculation. But I'm sorry, I don't have the, that attached, Mac. Thank you for sending me a spreadsheet that I can analyze for about 50 minutes um, for free. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, let me know your thoughts on the structure. Does 1099 or W-2... Uh, this also could be a wonderful topic on your podcast. And, Thank you, Mac, for your question. And hence, we're talking about it. So uh, pros and cons, Mac. Well, and first of all, your, your premise is correct. that it, It's the employer that gets to decide this, not, not the employee. And but let's just assume this. Mac goes, talks to the employer and says, listen, my wife for three years has been busting her tail. She's a great dentist, and you only gave her $10,000 in a retirement plan. We want to go 1099, and the and her boss says, "Okay, Mac, 1099." There's still pros and cons to it. There are. So let's let's talk with the cons first of all. The self-employment tax is double. Double. So here's what we mean by that: when you're an employee, you have 7.65 percent. We'll call it seven and a half percent withheld from your paycheck, and your employer matches that. When you go 1099, you're now the employee and the employer, so your self-employment tax that you pay is now 15% instead of 7.5%. So that's that's a downside. So you're, you're going to add another 7.5% tax. Yeah. So, yeah, there's benefits of potentially going into a 401k plan, solo 401k plan, that she could sure. put 18500 or twenty four five depending on how old she is. Right. Uh, but then she also potentially could have uh, the cap 1995 AB... <laughs> one ninety nine. The one ninety nine A cap A deduction. deduction. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, so. <laughs> anyway, let me b- b- backtrack one second. Okay. So if she if she gets a hundred thousand dollars from this employer, then seven and a half percent, seventy five hundred dollars. That would be the additional tax she would pay. If it's a couple hundred thousand dollars, well, she gets over the Social Security cap, but there's a Medicare that keeps on going. That's a whole other discussion. But at any rate, there, there's higher taxes because of that. However, <laughs> two, two pluses. One is you can do the solo 401k, as you mentioned, which is a bigger deduction than this, uh, the SEP that you got. More but mo- she doesn't even get the deduction because it's an employer she, contribution she, and she's correct. an employee. That, that's right. But at least she got it. Right, right, right. At least no, she I got understand. It. I understand. Um, if, if you do the 401k, you're, you're doing it with your own money. So uh, yeah. even, even though it's higher, it's your own money. But yeah, you alluded to 199 Cap A, which is uh, the brand new from the Tax Act uh, 2017. Uh, and this is now small businesses can take 20% of their profits, and then they can they can write that off as a deduction, with a whole bunch of rules, caveats, cautions. <laughs> but let's say married under three hundred thousand dollars of income. If you're single, it's about one fifty, one sixty. You know, as a dentist, married. If she, you know, combined salaries. If you're over three hundred, 
Mac, congratulations. If you're under, well, then potentially this could kind of weed in here. That's exactly right. So let's go with the combined incomes under, under 300000 Then, uh, Then your wife would take the, the gross income, let's call it 100000 just making up a number, and the expenses are, are twenty grand. So eighty grand is the profits, so net profits. Now you get to take 20% of eighty grand, $16,000. So that's an additional deduction. It's not a tax credit. It reduces your taxable income. And if your tax bracket, let's just because of easy math, let's right. say 20%, it's really probably 22 or 24%, but 20% of, of 16000 is 3200 That's your potential tax savings. So you save 3200 with a 199 cap A deduction, and you paid but you also seven, paid $7,500 additional, so your net still... You're still negative. You're still negative. Unless you got a lot more into a 401k, right? So And it, then it, you might break even. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> With all this work. As it turns out. And then you just lost $10,000 of free money from your employer. Now, if she's making 200000 it's a whole different discussion because now she's over the Social Security cap, which is, what, 127000 and change, so, somewhere around there. Right. And so then it's not a 15% tax. It's a it's a 3% tax, 29 to be exact. So maybe it now starts to make more sense. Yeah, but then I bet Mark Kohler, whatever his name is, was saying, because I, I read here, he's like switching because then she, he can do an S-corp and probably with some dividend allocations. So, hey, why don't I just have the the wife pay $10,000 of salary and then the rest goes as dividends yeah. and then there is no you know self-employment I, tax on the dividend. I, I think that's what Mark was getting at. We had him on our show. He's the rich dad, poor dad advisor. Remember that years ago? You forgot. <laughs> anyway, he was on our is show. It, was he, woo! Yes. Let's save some well, taxes. No, not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> he was pretty animated, but I know who you're talking I don't remember his name, but no, he wasn't that guy. <laughs> so this oh, was he the yeah, rich dad, poor, poor dad? dad? Of, yeah, because he was all sorts of the, the small oh, business and, yeah. you know, claim he, he was you coming know, car up seats with babies pretty, even if you don't have one. Pretty aggressive strategies. <laughs> yes. And we kind of just yes. said, okay, that's okay. interesting, Mark. Oh, that's a wrap. <laughs> that is a wrap. Um, so... I don't know, Mac. You got some options there, but you know, when you hear something on YouTube, it might sound really good on the surface, but then you kind of dive in a little bit and uh, you say, "Hey, well, well, I got to pay extra this, and I got to do this, and yeah, this, you gotta, and then you got to get pros and cons." Yeah. And but he did put together a spreadsheet, which I didn't look yeah. at, so I apologize. But Mac. I think and maybe you, you calculated all Andy's, this for us. Andy's got a comment. I, I was just going to mention this is going to go on YouTube as well. So, <laughs> so don't, don't, don't listen, don't to, listen us. to us. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. turn it off. So, yeah. But you fact check it. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. You got to fact check the facts. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, that's it for us. Want to thank Jean Chatsky. You can get her at hermoney.com. Andy Last did a phenomenal job today. And for Big Al Clopin, I'm Joe Anderson. Uh, show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Thank you very much. It was an honor to conduct my first interview as a part of the Your Money, Your Wealth team with the one and only Jean Chatsky. You can subscribe to this podcast at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Find links in the show notes if you want to subscribe on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, Player FM, iHeartRadio, TuneIn. And now you can also listen to the Your Money, Your Wealth podcast on YouTube. Now email your money questions to info at purefinancial.com or call 888-994-6257 and listen next time for more Your Money, Your Wealth presented by Pure Financial Advisors. For your free financial assessment, visit purefinancial.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision.